Uh, now, just as we're beginning, I want you to have a think about the, uh, the most godly person you know. Have you, have you got them in your mind? Now, now, what is it, have a think about them, what is it that makes their life different? I don't know, perhaps it's a, a gentleness in stressful situations or a a kindness to those who are nasty to them, or a, I don't know, a peaceful strength, that, that kind that kind of shines from them in ordinary life. Have a think. What is it? What is it that makes them different? And, and don't you just want to be like them? I do. You know, one person I can think of just, just pours out generosity and, and hospitality in a, in a way that always makes you feel welcome. And, and today's passage is one that is here to inspire us, like, like those people, to a greater, more glorious godliness. That's what it's here for. And it, and it does it, rather than showing others right now, it actually shows us the future. Now, our passage starts off with a phrase um, that may, might be, if you remember it, familiar at verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you. If you cast your minds back, it may remind you of chapter 17. That's exactly how chapter 17 begins. But then in that chapter, rather than showing us the bride, the angel was showing us the prostitute, Babylon. If you remember, it was a city of wealth, of pleasure, of power. If you, if you remember, it represented life in this world. E- even though it was written thousands of years ago, um, the, 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 the picture it felt very familiar, didn't it? It was a picture of the world around us, our friends and neighbors going around their usual life, our institutions, our political powers. But that was chapter 17. Here, John's now giving us a comparison Starting with them both in exactly the same way, he's wanting us to compare them. He's like, compare these women, the, the prostitute and the bride. Compare these cities, Babylon, the New Jerusalem. And ask yourself, he's saying, a really challenging question. Which do you look like? Which do you look like? Are you enjoying Babylon at any kind of given opportunity, or are you reflecting the new Jerusalem? Because that's what this passage is here for. It's to show us, it's an image of what we should look like. Now, we know that this image is a future one, don't we? We saw that last week because we saw this as the new creation. It's the new creation to come. So what John is getting us to do is kind of work backwards from the new creation back into our present, okay? Last week, we went the other way, if you remember. We went from all the old things that are passing away in the present to see the wonder of the future. But today, we're working the other way. We're looking at the future and letting it shape our present. Rather than looking sideways to the prostitute that we did uh, uh, a few weeks ago, we're looking forward to the bride. It's like, if if you wanna be a better sports a sportsman or sportswoman, you can either look, can't you, to the mistakes um, of others or, or yourself and learn from them, or you can look at kind of the skills and the brilliance um, of, of those who are more talented than you. And, and in chapters 21 and 22, John is kind of getting us to look at the second, to look at the, the brilliance. But instead of it being someone else, it's actually us in the future. Okay, it's a, a little bit of a mind bend, isn't it? Uh, months and months ago, we started the, the book of Revelation, and if you remember, there were seven letters, Jesus um, speaking seven letters through John, and each letter, Jesus was dealing with different aspects of, um, of, of life and, and things that needed fixing. And at the end of each letter, Jesus promised them something glorious, and what was it? 
for most of them, it was this image of chapter 21 of the new creation. He pointed forward to chapter 21 and 22. This image that we're looking at today is meant to impact us, meant to impact our present, meant to change how we live today. It's going gonna, it's gonna to spark our imaginations. It, it, it should light our hearts that we want to look like the future. We want to express the future in our present. Or put it a, a different way around, we want our presence to kind of correspond with, um, with the future, to re- reflect the way it's going to end, the completion of it all. Because either we're going to look like Babylon or we're going to look like the new Jerusalem. Which will it be? Which will it be? Because this future that we're looking at today has begun in us. It's it's kind of pressing in on the present. The holy city that is measured in this one was actually measured before in, in chapter 11 in the face of persecution. It's begun. We know from elsewhere in Scripture, the new creation has begun. It's begun in Jesus' resurrection. It's, it grows as people become Christians and in our lives. So as we look this morning at the completion of it all, the culmination of it all, the consummation of it all, let it fire your life now. Let it press in on your present. It's like we want the new creation bursting out of who we are and what we do. And the first image from the future is this, okay? The the new Jerusalem life is a life of God-lit holiness. A life of God-lit holiness. Okay, now we're going to get into this image in a moment. But a key to understanding it is this, okay? We are the temple city. Okay, as we'll see, uh, over the course of this passage, John uses metaphors in different ways. But this first picture that he gives at the beginning, this image of a, of a temple city, it's a symbol of people. We're not walking around with walls around us in the new creation. In a sense, we are the walls. We are the streets and the gates and the stones. Okay, I'll, I'll just briefly explain why I think why we should understand it like that, but it completely changes how we read this passage, and it is glorious. Now, why do I say with that? It's because the bride that he's uh, told about at the beginning represents people. We saw that last week. And the bride is the city. Then there are lots of these numbers 12s. You probably noticed them as we went through. We've, we've got 12 gates, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12 tribes. There's 12,000 stadia, uh, which is a measurement. And 12, if you remember, is the number of God's people. We've seen that throughout the book. But there's also something amazing about these 12 stones, 12 foundations of different colored stones in uh, 19, 20, and 21. You may have thought, why all the detail? Why are we being told these different stones? Well, these stones, or the, the Greek equivalents of these 12 stones, were actually put on the high priest's clothing in the Old Testament, each one representing one of the tribes. So he would have on his front 12 small stones, each one uh, with the name on So having all 12, that meant as the high priest went into God's presence, he was representing all the people of God. In other words, all these 12 foundation stones are actually the people of God. That's the picture. So as we look at this image, we need to realize God's people are the stones. We are the building, this city, this temple. And this is a glorious vision of purity and holiness. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. 
Then verse 18, that the wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. And then he lists these, these glorious precious stones, jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysophase, um, jacinth, amethyst. They're, they're pushing my pronunciations. They're, then giant pearls, did you see them in 21? The, the gates are a pearl. And then he finishes again, the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. Just just imagine it. Okay, these walls of precious jewels, gold, pure gold. Now, I haven't seen much gold in my life, except when kind of visiting a, a, a royal palace as a tourist. But the color, the beauty, the, the rich light it brings. And here is pure gold. There's no impurities. There's no smudges, no black streaks, no dimming or reducing of its majesty. The streets are pure gold. And then precious jewel upon precious jewel. Imagine the colors. I was chatting to someone recently, and we were saying how some of us struggle with different shades of color. Uh, it's just blue, or it's just green, perhaps that's you. There's no such thing as sky blue, or cornflower blue, or royal blue, or, or navy blue. No, it's just blue. But here, I reckon we'd see all the differences. The deep greens of emerald, the rich blues of sapphires the, and topaz, the extraordinary red of, of jacinth, and the purples of amethyst. Such beauty. And there's an extraordinary purity. Did you notice it's mentioned three times? Clear as crystal, clear as glass, transparent as glass. This is an extraordinary vision of the people of God. Pure and holy. People living lives as they were meant to live. Lives of love and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control, Christ-like lives. But, but why stones? Why glass? Why gold? Well, not only are they precious and beautiful, but they're precious because of what they do with light. They need to be lit up, don't they? That's why jewelry shops have amazing white lights in them. If you you ever go in one, just have a look. They have these pure white lights shining from above and shining from below. Uh, they're, They're precious jewels. Why? Because it's then they're stunningly beautiful. It's then their colors kind of reach their zenith and their peak. And it's the same with the new creation. The beautiful city needs light. Verse 11, the holy city has the glory of God, and so it has a radiance like a a most rare jewel. Verse 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamb. 22 verse 5, and and night will be no more. There'll be no uh, light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. There is a light and it is the glory of God. As God is with his people, they shine as they are meant to. That word in in, of radiance in verse 11 is the same as Paul uses when he says we're to shine like stars. With the glory of God shining in his people, they are are star-like. The the new Jerusalem life is a life of God-lit holiness. A life of God-lit holiness. God is present in a powerful way here. Did you notice that the city is a cube, if you're looking at all the measurements? It says its length and width and height in verse 16 are equal. And that's the same shape as the Holy of Holies uh, in the temple in the Old Testament. God is with his people like he's, he's in the Holy of Holies. The glory of God shining. This is a God lit life. And what a glorious life it is. The Christian life, it's not meant to be one of dour gray. Okay, it's not meant to be monochrome. It's not meant to be lives drab with moral drudgery, as one commentator put it. No way. It's meant to be lives of extravagant color, 
of blazing beauty as light shines through every kind of jewel. As God's spirit, as God's presence, as God's grace shines in us and through us, what an impact. Just think of the life of Christ, a life that has the power of God shining through it, a life of compassion and beauty and strength, a life of truth, a life of purity, a life that treated Uh, I don't know, authority with respect, the the opposite sex with dignity, the, the outcast like a friend, the marginalized like a brother. It is a beautiful thing to behold, isn't it, a Christ Christ life. Just remember that friend you thought of at the beginning. What a difference God's light makes to people's lives. Their their lives are lives of grace and love because they're God lit. And because it's lit by God, by his glory, for his name, it means we don't have to parade it. We don't have to show off our holiness at the street corner where people see it. No, it may be small, it may be slow, it may be unseen. But it's still refracting God's life into someone's life. I'm not sure what faces you tomorrow, but perhaps it It'll be as you walk into work, you can share a kind word to a tired, hurting colleague as you stand in the queue for the hand sanitizer. Or, Or perhaps a moment of patience with your tantruming child on the wet bathroom floor. Or perhaps as you you scratch a short Bible verse into a into a card that you're gonna send to someone struggling. But let's look like the new Jerusalem. Let's look like walls of beautiful jewels and streets of gold glistening with the light of the glory of God. That's what we're going to become. So may it be so today. May it be so today. But not only is the New Jerusalem life a life of God-lit holiness, it's also a life of God-nourished worship. A life of God-nourished worship. Now, as I said in the beginning, John shifts the ways his metaphors are working and his images. And in verse 22 of of chapter 21, we start to see uh, this shift. Now, rather than actually being the walls and the streets, people start to walk around this city. Instead of a, a symbol of what people will look like, the image shifts to our experience of the new creation. Um... Uh, And verse 24, by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And this is a picture here now we're moving into, a picture of worship. Do you see that in verse 24, the kings bring their glory. Verse 26, um, they will bring the glory and honor of the nations. This is an image of of worship and praise. A king only brings tribute and and honor, doesn't he, to to, uh, a more glorious king. He'll only kneel and offer his allegiance to a greater king. And again in verse, um, verse 3 of chapter 22, his servants will worship him, honor him, glorify him. This is the new Jerusalem life. It's a life of worship. And in chapter 22, we see the setting of this worship, the stage in a sense. And, and rather than a temple city, It's a garden city. Do you see that? The the river, there's a river flowing through the city with the tree of life either side. It's Eden, but but it's not Eden. It's it's a garden, but it's a garden city. It's not back to the beginning. Instead, it's, it's where the beginning was always meant to get to. The whole earth, God's kingdom flourishing under the rule and priestly worship of God's people. This is what Adam and Eve were told to do, to work and to keep it and have dominion over it. And this is a wonderful image of fruitfulness. A tree that yields 12 kinds of fruit every month, leaves that bring healing. It's a a picture of human beings cultivating, creating, uh, working to the glory of God. Whole lives uh, given as worship to God. It's, it's society functioning as it should. It, imagine it, kind of home life where, 
where the family works together to help each other all the time, a place of peace and, and no fighting or hurt. And imagine an office where there's, there's no backstabbing. Colleagues encourage each other, innovate, and, and reach targets together. Imagine open streets with, with no barred doors or dark alleys, friendly chatter rather than kind of a rude silence. This is society as it's meant to be fruitful worship. But again, as we saw with holiness, these lives come to fruition because of God, God himself. 22 verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Our worship is fruitful because it's God-nourished. The water of life from his throne brings fruit and life and healing. It's like a, like a river in a desert as its, as its watery fingers slip over dried soil, feeding its thirst. So plants begin to sprout, grass begins to grow, flowers blossom into manifold colors. What a, what a vision of fruitfulness. Just picture the, the green rolling hills of, of Aberdeenshire in the sunshine after days of rain. God is in the midst of his garden city. And so worship, the the tending of this garden is healed and restored because God's life, his love, his goodness is there. And and if, if life in the new creation needs nourishing by God, if it needs healing and watering and feeding, then how much more now? How much more do we need God's waters of life nourishing our lives of worship? I know I need it to to work for God's glory, not my own, to trust his provision and not be jealous of others, to to love when I'm tired. I need God's nourishment. And so what are you nourishing your lives on at the moment? What supports you? What supports us? Jesus said this in John 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Just as he will do in the new creation, so now Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, feeds us, nourishes us. And he does it through what the church over many years has called his means of grace. He nourishes us first and foremost as we we meet together today on Sundays as we receive his preach word, as we receive his, the, the Lord's Supper, as we pray, as we sing. But he also, he nourishes us as we prayerfully feed on his words in the Bible at other times, whether on, with our family, whether it's on our own or with a small group of believers. And by the power of the Spirit, he's nourishing us. He's nourishing us with a better story. It's the story of the gospel other good things are great for our body, for our minds, whether it's, I don't know, reading a book, playing some footy, getting to the seasides, but, but they don't nourish our souls with the story of the gospel, with the story of Jesus Christ died and risen and coming back, of our place in the world, of our identity as children of God, adopted in Christ. You know, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, the newspaper you read, they, they, don't, they won't tell you the old, old story. They might, on a good day, lead you to a a, a light snack, but on a meager diet will wither. Our lives will look anemic and pale because it's the gospel that frees us us to worship. As the Spirit shows us the depths of truth that we're in his world, saved by him, glorified in him, then we start to live lives of service and compassion. We contend his good world with creativity and hard work. One of my joys of being here at Trinity is getting to know those older than me. Because as I chat to you, I get a glimpse of years walked with the Lord, of years being nourished and fed by him. I'm sure we can all think of someone like that, someone who we've spent time with and that the the tenderness with which that person speaks of Jesus, the you know, their great companion through life's joys, their strong anchor through life's storms, and the way it pours out in lives of love for others, lives of service to the church, hospitality, kind words, welcoming smiles. 
You know, and if, if that's what 40, 50, 60, 70 years walking with the Lord, walking by being nourished by him does, then what's eternity going to be like? Because the life of the new Jerusalem is a, is a God-nourished life of worship. Does your life look like the new Jerusalem? Do you want it to look like that? Or does it look more like Babylon? Because there's a warning here, verse 27 of chapter 21, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. John is warning us that the people who slip into a half-hearted walk with God, who actually prefer Babylon, who listen to her lies, who walk, want to walk in her paths, they won't be in the new creation because they never wanted the new Jerusalem now. You know, if you'd call yourself a Christian here this morning, may this vision of the new Jerusalem lift your life towards your Savior. May you allow the future to press in on your present. Pursue holiness and worship. Why? Because, because your lives are written in the book of life. Because it, it, if, if our walk with the Lord fades, then perhaps there was no life there at all. Don't let that happen. And if you're not a Christian here uh, this morning, does this, this future, although it's pictured in strange images, does this future grab you deep down? Does it resonate in a way that the short-lived hopes of our society never can? If so, this morning, Jesus Christ, he's, he's calling you, he's inviting you, he's commanding you even to come and to join him, to trust him for forgiveness, to leave your life of sin as you follow him. Because the life of the new Jerusalem, this, this life that Christians, those who belong to Jesus, will be enjoying for eternity, is a life of God-lit holiness, a life of God-nourished worship. I can't wait to experience this fully, and oh, may it begin in me. May it begin in us today. Amen.